get started here, everyone? This is nice and cozy in here. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, first, I just wanted to check to see, can everybody hear me OK? Good? OK. And I'm going to try to not uh, talk too quickly, which is something that I <laughs> struggle with. So bear with me. I'll keep it you know, on point here. So thank you very much for being here. And for the folks online, thanks for attending um, that way as well. Um, we're really happy to be at this point. Um, it has taken a little bit, as you know, to get here. Um, but we're here now, um, and you know we've got this uh, assessment that we wanted to present um, to the community uh, to get your your thoughts and feedback, comments. Um, and that'll happen at the end of this presentation. Um, so I'm going to get through all of this, and I wanted to just note uh, that we have members of the assessment team in the audience here, and then we also have members of city staff here in the audience. Um, and I know yesterday we had a really lovely um, welcome for Amy Pitten. Um, so she's on board now. That's fantastic. Um, and then we've also got Arnie McMullen, who is here too, um, and has been, you know, really uh, critical in, in making this assessment happen. So without further ado, I'm going to kind of get into it um, and just kind of go over kind of the background of, you know, sort of what you know started the assessment. Um, so as you are all well aware, um, back in um, June, the director left, but we also had some other um, items that were part of the transition that are worth noting, something you know small like the pandemic, um, and then shifts in some of um, the programs. And so we thought it was a really good point to really take stock in where we are. And so um, we put together this assessment um, to do that. Um, and so really, you know, our real focus was making sure that um, the, the scope in which we were assessing was in alignment with the mission and purpose. Um, and then also to really look at the effectiveness of operations and uh, to make sure that there was, the, you know, the means for decision making. And so I'm going to go on to this next slide here. It'll come back. Just a little moment there. Um, and so this is what we're going to cover today as part of uh, this review. Um, so we're going to look at the timeline and methodology. We'll look at the scopes and area of study. Uh, we'll talk about key findings. And then we'll talk about areas of focus or the recommendations that we'll be putting in place as we move forward. And then next steps. Um, so this is a bit of a process. This is sort of the you know, start of the work um, that we need to do that's been identified here. Um, and I think we're primed to do that. So moving on to the timeline and methodology here, um, we really started doing the work of this assessment back around Halloween and through Christmas. Um, but we also were you know, doing some of this work um, after the start of the fiscal year. It's a little bit of a slow start, um, but we did uh, get there. And so what I want to highlight is that um, in terms of the methodology, you know, we really started um, with the budget as a, a performance indicator, but that really wasn't the full story, um, as you'll see as we get on here in the assessment. Um, what we saw from the budget is that there were some really key years where the senior center was doing really well, and so we decided to focus on those years and kind of see what the difference was between you know, current state and uh, previous state. And so we looked at 2018-19 um, compared to now um, to really kind of look at um, the details. And so Really what we wanted to do in this um, assessment was to evaluate programs for sustainability, reconcile the FEAST program proposal compared to current operations, and then enhance membership value and benefits. Um, and so that's um, sort of what we set out to do in a nutshell. And so here, um, as we move along, we've got the scope of what we intended to study. Um, yes? Yes, okay. yes, so yes. A lot of it's, repeated, it's actually a lot. A lot of it is a pulled directly from um, the assessment, mm -hmm. and so just kind of highlighting for you sort of key areas, um, so that you know the report is about 15 pages or so. But then there's also you know accompanying accompanying documents that really helped feed that report. And so I'm just this is a summary. Yes, Tina, you can get that report online, and then if you do want a copy, we can certainly get you one. Um, 
thank you for those questions. Um, so really, you know, here we are. We wanted to take a look at the programs. We wanted to take a look at feast and membership. Uh, so we also, um, it's a pretty large body of work. So we uh, wanted to kind of, you know, define what we were looking at. And so um, as you can see with programming, we really wanted to look at recommendations to support programming from development to implementation. Um, for FEAST, we wanted to look at um, the service level and resource allocation. And then for membership, we really wanted to look at the value of membership. Um, you know, I think we can sort of um, identify what the, that value might look like, but we wanted to really kind of put pen to paper and get that sort of down and documented. Um, so some other things that I just want to note here um, as part of the context is that from 2019 to 2024, the budget increased by 27%. Um, and so I just want to highlight that because that was something that we were seeing. And so we were curious about that. A lot of that is related to feast coming in-house. Um, and so not necessarily direct program, um, but it's something that has been talked about in the membership that we really wanted to kind of get our arms around. Um, and then the other thing to note is that Within the budget, the composition currently is a 70-30 split, um, programming and operations and feast. And so in working through this assessment, we kept those things in mind in terms of you know, where funding resources were coming from. You know, but that's really not the full story. Um, it's sort of just kind of the highlights for you. And this story of this assessment is not really about the numbers. It's just where it started. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to get into the details of each of these scope areas. Um, and so in the assessment, if you're looking at it, um, the real meat of that document starts on page 10. We wanted to kind of bring folks along for how we um, looked at details. Um, the other thing that I do want to note here before I move on, and it's related to the methodology, is that we did take a deep dive in each of the areas into the source detail. So for instance, um, with programming, we pulled all of the details from RecTrack and we're able to take a look at the historical data to see you know, what programs were offered, what the enrollment numbers were. Um, and then from there, you know, we were also able to kind of see sort of the costs associated with um, those programs. For FEAST, we were able to take a look at the um, contract when it was a contracted service. Um, we were able to look at the proposal that brought it in-house. And we were able to also take a look at if we had still used a contracted service using inflation, what that would have looked like in today's dollars, just to get a comparison. Um, and then for the membership, uh, we looked at you know, past and present benefits and you know, did some brainstorming. And so I just wanted to highlight those areas. And just back to FEAST, um, I know it's not a direct line, but with FEAST, we also took a look at other area meal sites and used the details from CVCOA to see how other sites were performing in terms of number of contracted meals. Um, so we really did get into the details here um, and then you know, sort of came up with the recommendations. Also, there was some really important um, information provided by the interviews that we conducted. Those were pretty critical in providing context and I think really um, helped me understand. Um, and then uh, from there, we also did the public forums. Um, and so much like this, this isn't the last time, hopefully, that we'll see you and engage on how we can do the work of the senior center and do better. So now on to each of the subject areas. Um, so uh, programs. So starting on page 10 of the document, that's where um, the key findings and recommendations are. Um, and so just looking at this slide here, these are some of the, the key takeaways and sort of items to kind of work on going forward. Um, we realized in looking at the way, you know, programming um, was being done, we really need to develop policy guidelines for programming. Um, the other thing that we noticed is that among some instructors, uh, there wasn't necessarily pay parity, and so there may be reasons for that. But, you know, we did identify that within a certain area, there might, you know, not be a similar pay schedule. And so we really need to kind of get our arms around why that is and make sure it's equitable. Um, and then from there, um, making sure that we're studying the profit and loss of programs. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that um, that particular program would be a neutral proposition, but overall, making sure that the programs are supported. Um, and then from there, it's really, you know, one of the things that we did here um, in sort of our forums and in the survey 
is just the you know affordability piece, making sure that you know we can you know provide the classes to membership um, at an affordable rate, um, and making sure that they're inclusive, um, because I also think that that's kind of part of this community too, is making sure that everybody um, can attend if they want to. And then um, we realized in looking into the systems that there was so much more that we could do, um, which is, I think it's exciting. Uh, but you know, leveraging those systems of record to get more data out of them quickly, so that then you know, as we're making decisions, we can pull those details so that then we can get them in the hands of the folks that make the decisions. So just making sure I didn't miss anything on my notes here. Um, some of the key factors that I did want to note, we've gone over sort of the, the highlights of the program section, but for the pay parity, I did note in the report that um, in some instances there was a spread of 25 to 87 dollars for a similar class, and so it's just you can kind of see the difference there. Um, then the other piece is the enrollment numbers, and so you know initially when we started looking at this, um, we did see a drop in enrollment. So in 2019, the enrollment numbers are at 4,329, and then you know currently it's at 2,000. 209 and so you can see that there is a big difference there in the enrollment in programming and so we just want to make sure that we can bring it back up and so it's just sort of a starting point um, and then you know we also looked at sort of what people would like to see those key offerings that are important and thinking that you know that's really where we might focus as we go forward and so some of the things that came forward um, probably not surprising but um, arts and crafts exercise film and music um, and so a lot going on in TRIPS. Um, that was another thing that's been mentioned a couple of times over, and I'm pretty excited about seeing what happens next there. So I'm going to pause there for just a quick minute just to see how the room's doing. Looks good. Matt, are we good online? Okay, cool. So just moving on to Feast. So this also starts on page 10. Um, here are some of the key suggestions or key findings um, from this. Um, and so, you know, really, uh, I was most interested in kind of seeing what this um, program looked like in the whole scheme of things. Um, and so just on the whole, looking at 23 numbers, um, we were contracted um, to provide uh, 14,935 meals, and we ended up providing 23,445 meals. That's a pretty big spread. Yes? For those of us who aren't intimately familiar with the FEAST program, could you step back just a bit and explain the difference between the congregate meals and the home-delivered meals? Yeah, so, well, so we do have um, both as part of our contract with the CVCOA, Central Vermont Area Agency on Aging. Um, and so the meals that are, you know, meals on wheels or delivered service are separate from those congregate meals which are provided regularly. Um, I can get into the details of the program specifically. Um, I just don't know, are the foods the same? Are they prepared by different chefs? No, they're not prepared by different groups. They're sort of the same group. No, okay, Tina, did you want to share what? Well, Tola cooks the congregate ones, and Solange cooks the Yes, that's fair, but they're both city staff, I guess, is what I was thinking oh. with that sort of comment. Um, and so we should talk about those things, though, for sure. Um, and I think um, as part of our review process, we did review job descriptions to kind of take a look at, you know, who's doing what and how. Um, there have been, you know, some shifts um, in how that work is done between those two folks. We do have volunteers and guest chefs that come in. Um, for the congregate meals, there are, as I understand it, it there's a lot more by way of um, volunteers that go into providing those congregate meals. Um, and then I think there is a little bit of a difference in terms of the funding source. Um, with the congregate meals, depending on um, eligibility, there may be you know, more of a, a private payer or a, you know, a patron um, kind of situation going on there, um, and so that that is definitely certainly a, a difference. So when people qualify by filling out that form when they come to the congregate meals, then CVCOA will contribute to that for each meal. So we can take a look at the contract for sure, um, but there there is part of the CVCOA contract that does allow for and stipulates congregate meals, um, and so it's part of the, what we need to provide as part of that contract. 
um, we also did here um, as part of this assessment process. It was a little interesting because on the one hand, we heard that people wanted congregate meals back. And then on the other hand, not so much. So it's just trying to figure out walking that fine line between the membership and you know determining what the right balance is. Yes. So that's you know sort of the interesting. So but there are things to tease out. I think that are you know really interesting there. That like we should talk about that. And that's where I think that this assessment is pretty valuable because it just I think pulls the details out. It doesn't um, necessarily uh, provide kind of an end result. It provides the factors to enhance the conversation around this program. Thank you. Yep. And and um, we have got questions. We did get a question from the advisory council, and we'll work to do like a quick uh, maybe one page FAQ on the program because there are different things that are offered under feast, and so there is some I think interest in learning more about that. And so uh, you're not alone in terms of your question. Some people do. Uh, and so when I actually don't remember what the report said, I, said, I remember that it said that there's money lost on each meal. Mm -hmm. and so that, that's an overall number, um, but we could certainly break it down. Yeah, it would be interesting to see whether how much is lost on the home delivery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the major um, issue is there is, oh, yes, Matt. If we could pass the mic around or if you could repeat the questions, it's hard for people on Zoom to Okay, hear so maybe what we'll do is we'll hold the questions until yeah, the end. Yeah. Is that okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the questions during um, the presentation um, because then it's more of a conversation, which I kind of like better. But um, I'll keep going with the details here. Th thanks, Matt. Um, okay, so um, we're going to keep moving along with um, just sort of the, the findings that we did find and we can talk about details um, in the question and answer portion. Um, so what we're looking to do going forward is align meal production with the staffing profile. So just making sure that, you know, what we're providing, um, we can support, uh, work with CVCOA, um, to evaluate programmatic options and determine how to pay for meals that are not reimbursed, um, which kind of gets to part of, um, the issue here that's been identified, evaluate the food costs. Um, we've had some pretty significant, uh, costs associated with inflation and so that definitely is a piece of this too. Um, evaluate the cost of meal service contract using current pricing. So we, we've done that as part of the initial analysis here but we'll probably continue to run the numbers to see what that looks like as we go forward um, and then determine the target service level provision to stabilize the program. And so as you can see within the assessment um, we're not breaking even at this point that's not surprising, um, but there are things that we can do. And so we've got to work to, to kind of uh, balance things out. Um, and then working with other area meal sites um, to kind of see how things are going. We could see in the CVCOA data that some meal sites were, you know, on, right on with their contracted values. Um, and so it's interesting to see, like, well, why is that, you know? So digging into some of those details and then also seeing what they do and how they do it. Um, and then focusing on community partnerships. We do have some community partners um, right now, but I think, you know, with the pandemic, some of those things have kind of fallen off, and I think that there's an opportunity to develop those relationships further. Um, as we've sort of indicated, um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight, just going back to the numbers, is in 2024, we are contracted for 17,161 meals, and so we'll be, you know, keeping an eye on that. Um, as it stands um, in 23, we um, were at a loss of $4.27 per meal. Um, and so we've got to get a handle on, you know, what that looks like. Um, and so that'll probably likely mean a combination of two things, you know, increased funding and also a reduction in expenses. And so we've got to figure out how to do that. So um, that's Feast. Um, there's a lot here um, to talk about, but again, you know, I think it's providing the, the groundwork to be able to have a good conversation and then make some progress moving forward. So uh, membership, um, just moving on there. So this is on page 12 of the assessment document. Um, and so really what we set out to do as we were looking at membership is to really 
um, provide value-based benefits. Um, you know, we've got quite a nice community here and just making sure that, you know, the, the benefits, um, you know, make people want to come here. Um, we also want to work on enhanced communication of those benefits, so making sure that, you know, people know, you know, what, what's available and what's possible. Um, and then work on a public. Let's see here. Oh, I think we're back. Good. <laughs> um, so the public campaign is just really, you know, I think one of the benefits or silver linings of this assessment is people really came out as part of this process to talk about the senior center. And so I think we've got an opportunity to really um, work on that and work on, you know, getting members and getting membership back up to, you know, where it was. Um, so we've got some sort of baseline details, but, you know, in the report you'll see that in 2019 the membership was at 1,189 members, and in 2023 it was at 757 members. And so, you know, we've got some work to do, but we, we can do it. It's just, you know, knowing where the numbers are and what that looks like. Um, so just looking at the slide here, there are some um, items that we identified. Um, so we're going to be working on establishing, reestablishing community connections. Um, and so Amy is going to work on that. That's one of the key things that she's starting right out the gate with um, that I think is going to be really good for enhancing the work that we do. Um, and then we're going to be focusing on um, the membership campaign. So maybe perhaps offering um, different prom promotions. So we'll brainstorm a little bit on that. Um, and then maybe even looking at um, you know other sort of um, either you know punch cards with area businesses or looking at discount discounted programming. So like if you sign up, then you might get a free class or you know anything of the like just to get people to come back. Um, and then we'll work on enhancing benefits. Here are some of the things that we were kind of brainstorming, but I think we're open to all ideas. Um, and so one of them, as I sort of mentioned, was discounted local businesses, maybe a, a check-in call program, um, a bereavement program, or a how-to series. Um, and then um, some of the other areas is um, you know, focusing on events that you know, provide values for member and create community um, engagement. And so maybe a summer concert series or you know, picnics in the park. Um, and then one of the things that's been pretty popular is um, just computer access. But we also um, need to sort of work through some of the details. Matt does that now, um, but then also maybe enhancing that opportunity for membership. And you know, we used to have a computer lab, but there's a little bit that goes into that. And so we're going to work through those uh, details. So just taking a quick pause here. OK. And so. Yes, yes, I mean, there's, there's more than one, just, so, it's got to drop down there, so, anyway, <laughs> so everybody knows. Um, so what I wanted to do here, and sort of the recommendation, sorry if anybody's sensitive to the strobing, everybody good? Okay. Um, so uh, I wanted to sort of really highlight sort of the critical areas as part of the assessment so that then, you know, it's not all things, there's, you know, um, the pieces that we want to focus on going forward. Um, so for programs looking at sort of doing a rate study um, to evaluate the current rate composition and comparative market data, um, it's something that we talked about as part of the assessment team. Just explain what that means. Yeah, I will. You got it. Yeah, nope, understood. That, that is a question that we also got as, the, as part of the um, presentation to the advisory council. So here it is. Um, George had asked me to explain what this first bullet means. Um, and so I'm going to do that. Uh, so what that means is that as we were looking at um, the programs and looking at all of the um, factors that go into you know, a, a rate for a particular program, there are very details there. Um, so whether it's you know, instructor pay or supplies or you know, facility charges or any of that, kind of considering what um, comprises that rate. Um, the cost, yes, Tina, you know, the cost of that rate. Um, and then comparing it to, you know, the area, the universe or the local environment for that particular service. And so whether it's a private, say, yoga studio or, you know, something that is being provided just for the senior centers, um, making sure that we're sort of within range of what seems appropriate for that service 
and then determining um, you know, where things land. So a rate study is a little bit more involved than just pulling things directly out of our system. Um, and so, like, so we could do, do justice to it. Um, we want to make sure that we are able to really take a close look at the cost of programs and compare it to you know, what those services would be out on the open market locally. So that's, that is our intention, but I'm also happy to talk a little bit more about it. Okay, good. Um, so we talked about pay parity a little bit. We just want to make sure that there's equity there um, and then create transparency for folks so that, you know, we can talk about it. You know, I think uh, I was surprised to see that. And so um, I also, you know, there, there may be certain justifications, but making sure that they're known um, as part of that, creating transparency and then creating standard operating procedures and policies for um, program implementation. Um, when we were back in 2019, you know, things worked pretty well, and there is a lot from that time period and going forward, but I think identifying really clear guidelines and you know, sort of I, making sure that they're known so that then they're expected, and also then if you know, something is different from what those policies or guidelines might be, we have something to talk about. So that's at least establishing that sort of base level and then you know, going from there. Um, and then making sure that we develop support for trip planning, driving, and facilitation. It's one of the things that people really said they wanted um, as part of you know, uh, programming, is making sure that we're um, working on trips. I mean, now the well, pandemic's still lingering, but um, making sure that we can get that going. So then just moving on to feast, um, bring back congregate meals. So we're working on that. Um, provide affordable quality meals. Uh, develop meal production sustainability and enhance volunteer efforts. That's pretty straightforward, I think. Um, but those are the areas that we do really need to focus on going forward. And then for the membership, focusing on special events, um, alignment with area senior centers, um, and enhance affordability, uh, discounted, you know, items at area businesses, maybe, you know, that there's, you know, punch card, like I was mentioning, and then new offerings, um, so we can provide value. And so, just moving on to sort of uh, uh, conclusions and next steps here, and so we want to focus on the priority recommendations um, that we've got here, and so we've already kind of worked a little bit uh, with Amy on, you know, some of the, the key projects that we're going to be sort of launching into on the program and membership side. One of the things is really working on those community connections. Um, the next is working on sort of the program development cycles and making sure that, you know, we're squared away there. Uh, working on a membership campaign. Um, so those are sort of some key areas for Amy. And then for Arnie and I, we're going to be launching into um, doing uh, intensive work with the FEAST program um, so we can get a handle on what's happening next and also to make sure that we can kind of divide and conquer um, so that there is not a... Um, so we can make sure that there's focus on the programming membership because that's just really important. I think we've really seen that. Um, and so we want to report our progress out to the membership um, in April, um, April 15th. It's a nice day. Um, so, you know, we'll see how far we can get between now and then. Um, we will certainly have more information for you. Um, but I also want to make sure that we are briefing you periodically so you know where we're at. Um, and then if you have comments, questions, concerns, we can talk about them. Um, and then, you know, we will be working... Um, on integrating the work of this assessment into the strate strategic plan. We have a community services meeting. So community services is recreation, senior center, and parks meeting on the 22nd. And so we're gonna start to work through some of the strategic planning. We do have um, work plans for each of the divisions. And so some of this will be integrated into those work plans. And then it'll be rolled up into a strategic plan. So what I'm hoping is that this assessment really it's just the start of how we do strategic planning and move the senior center forward. So that's what I've got for today. Um, and this is, you know, last but not least, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, there have been a lot of folks that have helped with this process, um, and you can see them all listed here. Uh, we, I, Arnie, uh, and our assessment team couldn't have done the work without um, these people, and um, we are incredibly thankful to have been able to do the work. 
So now we're at the questions, comments, and I understand we're probably going to want a microphone. Um, little, whew, lights. <laughs> Yes. Um, I think we ought to take each topic in question and then finish that topic and move on to the next one. If we start with programs, and I think we should talk about about the question for the programs, and then and then we go on from there. So I'd like to start with programs. I have questions about each area. Can you hear me, or should I use the mic? Use the mic because people. Are you the mic? Okay. No. You don't know? Okay. So I'm George Olson. Uh, I live on 20, 25 Hubbard Street in Montpelier. Um, and one of the things I'm concerned about is the pay parity, parity issue. I don't think that we can compare a volunteer organization to businesses that make widgets or do other things that are related to um, their, their own economy. Um, we have a lot of volunteers. Um, we have volunteers that volunteer their time, their effort, and even contribute money uh, for, for materials that they might, might use. And some volunteers uh, chose, choose to ask a certain pay, par pay amount, and others don't. I'm worried about the pay parity thing. I don't think we should, we should um, limit one's willingness to volunteer and volunteer their time and maybe even uh, um, the amount that they get paid for what they teach and what they do. So um, uh, <clears throat> I guess, and the other piece is I, I just, how to bring back membership. I think one of the most important things is socialization for seniors. Seniors need to be together. They need to come together. One of the things that helped that happen were the congregate meals. And I don't understand why we can't bring them back right away rather than waiting uh, till this assessment process is over. <laughs> Th those are my comments about programming, thank you. my phone? Yes. Yeah, if, that's, if that's okay? Okay. Um, and Laura, do you mind saying something? Yeah. Or time is up. Yeah, so just like while I'm on the other end. 30 seconds remaining. 15. <laughs> <laughs> the time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> So I'll be I'll be keeping this in front of us. You don't have a hook though. It doesn't need a hook. Everybody was very good the last time. You're good. So um, just to so just uh, just to comment on those two things. Um, so for pay parity, uh, you know, I think it's brought up for discussion purposes. I don't want it to be limiting, and I want to make sure that there's justification for why something may be. You know, so that it's, you know, I want to make sure that there's equitability in it. I just want to emphasize that it's the volunteer program here that we're talking yep. about in many, many cases. I even, I even fill out a form every time I come in to volunteer. And there's a, there's a reason for that, I, I guess. I'm not sure what that is, but maybe Norma can speak to it or Matt. Um, why do we keep track of volunteers then? Right. Yeah, it's for grants. Um, yeah, yeah, so there, there, there's good reason for um, tracking that time, um, just because it then can provide an in-kind match for funding and, you know, to support the, the work. Um, so, yeah, George, I get your comments, and I think um, it's, you know. Um, and then just to talk a little bit about the congregate meals, so we're working to, it's not, you know, sort of that we're going to delay in bringing it back, we'll bring them back as we can. Um, we're working on building up that volunteer base to be able to do so and then maybe shifting some things around. There was a question about um, the food served and preparation therein. And so maybe working with our staff to be able to prepare the meals that go out along with the meals for congregate meals to make sure that then we can, you know, maybe um, work with economies of scale. Well, it's not on. Hello, Erica Garfin. We have lots of good uh, quantitative data, and I think it was really helpful as a next step to gather qualitative data about a number of things. Um, at why we 
see some of those numbers, and one of those is, this is on page 10 of the report, that even the, the enroll enrollment areas is declining. I think it would be really interesting um, to know why. Are there fewer classes? Is there less variety? Are people still reluctant to gather after, because of COVID? Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Be okay without a mic, no, I think. Oh no, we can't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, that the I think there was a comment in the and you mentioned it here about people saying they wanted congregate meals but they didn't want to come or some. Yeah. yeah, that was that could have been just the result of I think a weirdly worded you know survey question or I think people were thinking. I, I remember when we talked about this, it was people thinking way in the future, like they'd like to have more congregate meals. But on a more immediate basis, they were afraid to come in the site. You know, those were questions we asked. Just as you know, just as things were kind of loosening up, and people were still still had that fear. It's it is kind of a contradictory little piece of data. Um, so that was about the congregate meals. <coughs> Hello. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, With the, <laughs> with, there we go. With the changes and Amy coming in, um, I'm hoping that Amy will have enough authority to do her job and that the town manager's office isn't controlling um, who will come in. seeing a lot less of me in the city manager's office. I think we wanted to make sure that things were stabilized. We wanted to make sure that you have what you need. And I think, you know, we feel that we can take a step back. Um, because we do. That's not our intention to, to run the senior center. Uh, I was concerned with the change in title, which is no, not the... Uh, uh, the oh. Thank you. That uh, her title is no longer director, and um, which m made me think that she might ha not have as much authority and control over her budget. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the there is to go to an integrated community service model. That being said, we're trying to make sure that we can put resources where they're needed so that then the focus can be on those budgets that are associated with programming and membership and not get sort of locked into sort of a larger leadership structure. Um, so, um, and she has full autonomy to do what she needs to do for the senior center. Do you also have... Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. You also have questions from the people on Zoom. I don't yes. know how you want to handle it. Matt, do you I want to read them off? Yeah. Um, could you say your name when you're talking so we know who you are? Yes. I mean, not you. Right. You. <laughs> this is from an anonymous participant. <laughs> Why must fees be kept separate from the program manager? from what the program manager works on. She will receive most of the comments about meals, I would think. So that's a good question. And so I think you know that will not necessarily be how it will always be. I think we've got some work to do. So I mean, I think even just my previous comment, coming back to that in terms of the city manager's office not being involved, that's an area where we probably likely will still be involved for a little while yet, just to make sure that the program can stabilize. And then once it is stabilized, then 
you know, I think sort of the day-to-day -day operations of that program will still sit where it has um, historically. Also from an anonymous participant, thank you for all your efforts. Could you please describe how you are framing and approaching affordability of MSAC programming in light of the reality that many slash most area older adults live on a fixed income? Market rate of area yoga classes, for example, is out of reach for many retirees. An excellent point. Um, affordability is a huge issue, I think, and I think we want to make sure that um, anything that is offered here is inclusive, and anybody who wants to be part of the programming can be. And so I think it's working, you know, with making sure that we can keep the you know cost to members for classes down, um, but it's also really doing that analysis to do a true assessment of what it costs to provide those programs. So. If there is um, a, a gap in you know, how much it costs and how much we're charging, we can make up that gap. So it doesn't necessarily fall on the backs of members, but we have a plan for how to proceed. And so that's the work that we're going to be doing next, really, is making sure that um, things are reasonable. And affordability is one of those terms that is a little slippery um, because affordability means different things to different people. Um, and depending on what your means are. Um, and I think we want to make sure that we're striving towards making sure that everybody can participate. So um, we'll work towards making sure that it is. I think, you know, again, with the survey results, it's a little of a mixed bag on that question, but it may be the way we ask the question um, or getting information. But I think that that's also where we'll need to do a little bit more of the qualitative work around that area. About, did we have a question about scholarship, the use of scholarship on this survey? Um, I don't remember. I would need to look at that. I don't know if we had something explicit um, on scholarship. We've, we certainly talked about it as part of the assessment process. We talked about it at the advisory council, um, and it will be a discussion going forward that Amy has already sort of you know, keyed into. Yeah, so I think it'd be interesting to get, engage people in that whole idea about why they feel shy about asking for scholarship money. I think that's what we've always heard. We say, you can't take a course, there's scholarship money. But what I always hear is that people feel shy about or humbled by you know, asking for money. And maybe what we could think about asking the members, what, how could we approach that better to get more people to use the scholarship and therefore engage them and, the, and therefore keep prices down. <laughs> Hi, Johanna Nichols. Um, I, my question is, um, so who supervises the fees staff and who supervises the, the um, MSEC staff? So, uh, thank you for the question. Um, so, structurally, you know, things really haven't changed on the org chart. Um, right now, um, the sort of the office staff is directly supervised by Amy. The fee staff, you know, is sort of on the day to day, still supervised by Amy. However, there is a component there as we work within the program that, you know, there will be. Um, some review of those positions and those job descriptions at a higher level. I, I guess to uh, Johanna's point, is there an evaluation process underway? Um, evaluation process for underway for, for staff? So um, we have reviewed the job descriptions as part of um, Amy coming on board, she has those job descriptions, and so we're working with them and working within the context of the current job descriptions. I think right now we're really focused on um, the key areas rather than you know the staff specifically. But that is also a big part of the picture, right? Because I mean, you know, we can't provide the service without the people. You know, like so we're working through it. I mean, it's there's going to be more to come for sure. I, 
so, um, what? Oh, I'm. Uh, my name is Bill Dolger. I was on uh, the committee. Uh, so, it, when would you set a date for the start of the next assessment? Maybe in the fall. Um, so, and good question. Um, so I think depending on sort of the strategic planning process, then we would start to firm up dates. And in, with, with regards to the strategic planning, would you have uh, uh, one or two members again from the membership participating in the planning? Sure. I, mean, I, I think we definitely benefited from having um, members on the assessment team. And so I think that that would be something to you know, do in the future. And Amy also. So not a question, but just a series of comments from maybe Alice Fisby. Um, and I think some of these were related to the feast discussion. So um, she says, those of us who are older are those who want the meals. In the past, our chef made the congregate meals as well. We need programs in-house for those of us who, with disabilities who are not able to go to parks, etc. If you want older members to join, you must qua have quality congregate meals. Thank you. That's a good comment. Okay, anything more on feast for right now? This isn't the only time we can talk about it. I hope we can talk about it more. <laughs> I guess I guess it's been covered by um, the assessment uh, document. <clears throat> my, my, I guess I have a sort of comment. It appears that uh, from this report, the senior center no longer can subsidize feast, and feast, I believe, is endangering the physical health of the senior center. I, so uh, this, you can't have a cost for a meal be um, the subset part of it at four dollars, and let's say the meal costs ten dollars. So you have to make up the six dollars. Well, who makes up the six dollars, right? And so that's deficit spending, and that's really bad for this this uh, senior center. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't So um, that is, those comments are comments. That's why we wanted, in part, to do this assessment. You know, we were certainly hearing things anecdotally. Um, I think we have to come up with a plan that creates conditions where the feast program is neutral in, in terms of not impacting the bottom line for the senior center budget. And so. And I also think that we have to have the conversation about the value of those meals. You know, and so I think putting all the details out there for folks to take a look at and consider out in the open is really good and healthy because then we can have a conversation. And then also, from a staff perspective, we have to start to make plans for making it whole. Like, we can't continue the way that we are. And that's what this assessment says. The timeline, I think it was, uh, for, I've forgotten your name, but uh, you, so forth. I, when do you think that this will happen? This uh, solutions so I guess maybe aren't. Yeah, so um, that's a good question. I mean, I think in terms of thinking about fee specifically, like we will be taking a pretty critical eye between now and the end of the fiscal year because we have to. Um, I think some of the other items will be sort of longer term and maybe a little bit more organic. Um, and so, the, and that's also in part why we split the recommendation at the end. Because I think, you know, there are, there's work that is being done to support the senior center that is not feast. And so I think we can really um, move forward with those things. And then for feast, we've got to address that. Hi, I'm Cindy McLeod. Um, After I was director, um, and the 
the meal program was supplied, National Life gave it up, and it was supplied through a program that I understand, it was called Just Basics. And, and I believe that that was all done to keep the two separate and keep the finances separate and to be able to really um, raise money for the meal program as opposed to the senior center. And my question is, um, did you look at that? It seemed to be a reasonable structure. And is there any chance of going back to that instead of putting I know the Council on Aging wanted the Senior Center to take over the meal program, but is there, um, and I know historically there was a real reluctance for the Senior Center to do that because they felt like it would take all the, um, all the attention would go to the meal program as opposed to the rest of the operations. And my question again is, is there any chance of going back and doing that and making just basic, um, a real meal focused program that included like the food shelf and all the other meal programs um, in this community. Thank you. I think anything's possible. Um, anything's possible, you know, and I think that we have to really evaluate where we are um, and where we're going um, because, again, we can't keep just doing what we're doing. Um, and so I, I imagine that there will be a variety of options. Probably something like that would be on the list. Um, comment from former MSAC director Jana Klar. A bit of perspective. I think it is important to understand that nearly every Meals on Wheels and Congregate meal program across the country is subsidized. There is a small federal reimbursement, but it has hardly gone up in over a decade. And when receiving those monies from Older Americans Act originally, a fee cannot legally be charged for the meals for eligible meal recipients. Nutrition programs are essential not only for food security, but all the vital wellness checks and social connection they provide to homebound people, not a luxury. And I was just wondering how often is the um, contract with CVCOA negotiated? Is it? annual and is it coming up soon okay okay it's a federal reimbursement so you're negotiating with the federal government through them through them yeah. so it's a little different <laughs> Uh, I, understand, I understand and appreciate Jana's comments about that. I think the issue is that maybe at this point, because of pandemic, and I think uh, COC <laughs> is looking at this, sorry about that, is looking at this because there are some people who may not be eligible. And I think it's really important that we provide these meals for people who really need them and who qualify. And not Thank you. Looks like Matt's got another question online there. And then Mary. Mary. It, well, it was mostly a response to what George said. So again, from Jenna Clark, the federal money goes to the state and then area agencies on aging, in our case, CBCOA. Our contract with CBCOA is renewed every fall for October 1st start. They set lo our local rate, not the feds. This is on the same subject. It's my understanding that there is a Vermont organization, I don't remember the title, but senior meal programs have an organization in Vermont. 
And if, in fact, the federal sub hasn't been increased for a long time, there must this must be a national issue, and I'm kind of wondering when all the area agencies on aging in this country are going to go on a rampage. I'm for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I really appreciate everything um, that has gone into this. Um, and I think, you know, it is just sort of a start, a fresh start. Um, and I'm thankful to be doing it. Um, I think we're in good shape. And again, if you have any questions, but otherwise, you probably will be seeing a lot less of me. <laughs> yes? Did you Are we talking about membership yet? <laughs> 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 um, I'm struck, I'm looking at page five, there's a table um, that looks at the difference between 2019 and uh, 2023. Mm -hmm. um, new memberships declined by 63%, which is stunning, um, and clearly already people are generating ideas about that's really critical, how to go after that. but. Um, renewals declined by 29%. And I think this is another one of those areas where it would be really useful to get some more information about why um, by contacting. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing RecTrack could tell us who were members in 2019 and, and do interviews or focus groups or something to find out why they are no longer members. Yep. And just in general, I mean, I think it's, um, it's really important to get to the why before action planning starts, to know that you're actually addressing the cause. Thank you. I do want to remind people that we have a lot of members in their 80s, and. We do have death, um, so I, I assume that we have, we've always been losing members sure. that way. So I am curious, uh, what is the age range of who's here? What is the age range of who's, who's we was here and we've lost? Uh, and also, because we're, people are in their 80s, they also can't necessarily get to the senior center anymore. Um, some of them are taking, uh, like bone builders, for instance, online. So you know we're hanging on to them that way. But um, but we are an aging organization, so we do have to keep getting fresh members. Um, I know two people who are thrilled that they're turning 50 this year, so they can join. <laughs> and um, and that's good. But we've always had a lower membership in the 50s and uh, early 60s. When we had the ability to um, subsidize people to use First and Fitness, we got a lot of people in their um, late 50s and early 60s. We don't have that anymore. We've talked with Green Mountain Fitness, but we haven't gotten anywhere with them yet. And uh, pool. Yeah. It would also be interesting to me to learn about those people who think the senior center is for old folks and just don't want to go where old folks go. Um, I think there's a certain element of the population that's like that. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if it would be profitable to identify those people, even if we can, um, but then maybe it would be, I don't know. That gets to stereotypes, and there's a stereotype that old people are, well, they're old, they're infirm, they're not physical enough, uh, whatever. Um, I just read a book, um, This Chair Rocks, and one of the points that she made was, 
if you met one 81-year-old, you've met one 81-year-old. That's it. So we're all, we're all different. We all have different abilities, physical strengths, weaknesses, whatever, uh, mental acumen. But uh, we're here. And we're tough. <laughs> One concern I have is that there's only been a very brief and passing reference to COVID. And I don't think we can underestimate the impact that pandemic has had on all of us here. So, yeah. Yeah. There was a time when we were, um, what, what was the year? One year when we didn't, we didn't do a membership drive at all, right, Norma? Um, yeah, 2020. Yeah, we just decided because of COVID we wouldn't even bother, you know, trying to get people back as members. And I think people fell fell off the rolls then and just never got the push to come back. Um, that's one reason, and I think Erica's idea is a good one. Let's find out where people are. Come back. Hi, it's Cindy McLeod again. Um, back, back even before all your charts, you know, when I was here from 2005 to 2011, the things that really generated the most excitement and the most, most activity, where people were buzzled, buzzing in and out all the time, you know, and, um, or things like the computer lab, um, the trips, the, um, New classes, most of the classes that we've offered forever and ever and ever and ever. And affordability, because you're dealing with a lot of people who have incomes between 15,000 to 20,000 a year. And, and those are high, you know, you can't afford to take more than one class at that, with that amount of income. Um, but there was a lot of buzz. There were coffee, people were having coffee after classes, um, and, and they'd throw in money. Um, but it was a really fun place to come. And I'm not saying it isn't now, but just getting people to drop in and, and connect with other people. It was called a gathering place for healthy living. And and if you had a class, great. Oh, the other thing I wanted to address is if you want to get younger working people, you got to have classes after 5 o'clock. I mean, a lot of people are working at home and can do classes, but you got to do that too. So um, I think the people are out there. I think people do want to come. I think the drop-in groups are fabulous, and that really has become more important to me through the time because um, you don't always want to do six to 12 weeks of something. Thank you. Uh, two comments. So uh, this is from Janet going back to uh, what Mary had said about lobbying for Meals on Wheels. So there's already an organization called Vermont Association of Senior Centers and Meal Programs, colloquially known as VASCAMP, um, and they've been lobbying for years for increased meal reimbursements. And Mary Alice Bisbee says, um, I can, uh, let's see, sorry. As someone who is 70, 87 and friends, has friends in their 90s, some of whom who do not want to join because the meals are gone and the programs are all on Zoom or not appropriate for these ages. We must have reasons to come back. And she wanted to thank George for your comments about uh, seniors are strong. Okay, I think this time for real. So I'll just say thank you again. Um, I really appreciate it.
to a good listener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so.